We've got Joe, Jane, Nate, Sherry, Jim, Lewis, Neil, Betsy, Ursinos, Jim. I think I maybe already said Jim, but that's the way it always goes. Hope you're all doing well. 
That was a tune called Phoebe Ice. It's the tune of the week. We'll play that at the end and have a good time with it. If you're new here, first off, welcome and let us know in the chat if it's the first time viewing for you. We've got a great little community always going in the chat, uh, so don't be afraid to speak up. The way that these all all these live streams work is it's an hour of Q&A. So if you have any questions about mandolin or music or anything like that, uh, throw it out there. No question too simple, no question too advanced. It's all fair game. And we'll have a good time with it. If you want to hear a particular tune and I can happen to remember it at the time of request, I'm happy to try to do it. I don't do anything copyrighted or anything like that, but it's not, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask. All right, um, yeah, so throw out the questions. I love trying to keep up with the chat. We'll jump right into it. The Mitten, Jane, love it, love the Mitten. Uh, folks from all over the world, love to see it. Neil says, love the, shove the pig's foot. Oh yeah, the intro tune, me too, that's a, that's a great tune. We should, we should do that one as a, a jam sometime. I think it's been a little while. Uh, let's see. Ursana says, dang it, I'm late. Not late at all. You got here just while I was playing the, the intro tune. Have I played 10,000 hours? A great question from Jim. Let's do a little back of the, back of the napkin math here. Um, let's see. I started playing in 20, or sorry, in the year 2000-ish. So that's 22 years. Um, time... We got to get to the number of days. So 22 years times 12 months times 30 days. So I'm already at eight, almost 8,000. <laughs> so that's just how many days I've played. Uh, can I get that to focus? Yeah. So if I've played an hour and a half a day, I've hit 10,000. When I think I definitely have played an hour and a half a day. Especially early on, I was, you know, once once I really kind of got into the swing of it, I was doing a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, I would say I'm probably closer to 20,000 hours. Um, but, you know, it all kind of, it's all relative. The, you know, the, the more hours, the better, of course. But, you know, it really kind of depends on what you're focusing on. You know, 20,000 hours of playing fiddle tunes isn't going to make me a better jazz musician, if you know what I mean. And some of those hours I spent learning jazz, some I spent learning classical, some I spent learning other instruments, some I spent learning fiddle tunes, Irish tunes, old time tunes. Um, you know, it's all it's all related, but it's all a little different. So anyone else have a, a, a guesstimate on their number of hours they've been playing? <laughs> Uh, Lewis says, looking forward to hearing about Weezer. Yeah, so Weezer is a, technically it's a fiddle competition uh, held in Weezer, Idaho every June. And I just got back from there. And the way it works is uh, on one side of these big old buildings, there's a, kind of, there's a big kind of RV camp and people set up in a big high school baseball field and there's, there's uh, instrument competitions, so there's like fiddle competitions and banjo competitions and band comp competitions. Um, and then out back and behind the building, there's all this lush, beautiful grass on the, the competition side. And then out back is what's called Stickerville, which is where I just was. Got this very red t-shirt that's probably kind of blinding you all. Didn't think it would be quite so red on the screen. Um, where... It's really dry, and apparently in past years, it's been going for like 30, 40 years or something now. Um, but in past years, it, the, the ground was really kind of full of like stickers and things that'll stab you in the feet if you walk around barefoot. Um, so it was, uh, so it's, it's kind of a different scene, and that's where all the kind of old time people go, not to compete, but just to sit around and, and pick. Um, so I was there for a week. Probably speaking of hours, I was just thinking, you know, for that week, I bet I, I, I bet the least amount of picking per day that I did was about ten hours. You know, there's nothing else to do. I didn't go over to the competition side really. I didn't see any of the events or classes. I just sat there and played music with a bunch of new friends. Um, so that's seven hundred hours. Is that no? That's not right. That's seventy hours <laughs> of of music in one week. Um, which is just the way I like it. Um, 
Yeah. All right. But yeah, great time. If if you got a uh, either a festival or a camp or a competition nearby, any kind of you know whatever kind of music you're into, go out to the events um, when at all possible. It's a great way to meet. Like I hadn't met all that many old time musicians uh, in Portland, um, just because when I first got here it was a pandemic, and then the first folks that I met were Irish musicians. I've been playing almost exclusively Irish music since we moved here. Um, just because that was the first scene that I met up with. But I love old-time music, so I went out there. You know, I drove six hours into Idaho uh, and sat around with a bunch of my neighbors. Met a bunch of people who are, like, literally blocks from me that now I get to play music with. So we're going to... It's a great way to meet folks. Kind of everybody comes out of the woodwork, and you'll meet some neighbors and make some connections to make music with. So whatever's in your area, look it up, ask around on Mandolin Cafe or whatever, uh, you know, in your community and see, see what's out there and just go and see who you find. What's your thoughts on the Pava mandolins compared to a Collings? I love them both. Um, you know, I think it, it just kind of depends on the individual instrument. They're both making amazing instruments. You know, I'm playing an Ellis here. So Pava is coming out of the same the same uh, workshop as Ellis mandolins. Um, I've got a bunch of friends with Pavas. They all sound amazing. Um, I've played a bunch of Collings. I've owned Collings. I've owned a Pava briefly. You can't go wrong with any. I'd say, you know, get your either find a good deal on one or get your hand on a bunch if you can get yourself to a music store that stocks them and, uh, you know, just see what you can find. But ultimately, I you know, I don't have a, a huge preference on one over the other i think just you know it's all instrument specific like specific instrument like oh do i like this pava or this collings it's gonna depend on your style you can't go wrong with either jeffrey from northern ireland welcome first time from rough walker panama city florida Uh, there's not so like being around from the start. Well, you can always go back. These are always available. If you miss any part of them and you want to relive the magic, you can always go back and, and, and watch them at a later date. But I know it's, it's, it's hard to beat that, that beautiful live experience. <laughs> Joseph, good to have you here. 20 years times 365 days times 8 is 58,000 hours. Oh, yeah, I could have just done 365. I don't know why I did... Maybe I should adjust my math. <laughs> All right, let's do 22 times 365 is 8,000. Wait, that's too many. 22 times 365, 8,000. So, yeah. I've been playing for 8,000 days. Ish. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you're put if you're putting in eight hours a day, that's that adds up real quick. Can you uh, King of the Fairies? I'm playing that at a Fiddler's Convention today. King of the Fairies. I don't think I can pull that one out. I if somebody else was leading it, I could totally follow along. Oh wait, is it this? Nope. Is that right to man? Right to man. Sorry, I can't help you with uh, with King of the Fairies. Great tune. I think I have a lesson on it, but I don't play it enough to have it at kind of top level memory right now. Especially being in old time land for for the last seventy hours of my playing. Oh yeah, Neil says he's been enjoying the videos on the new instruments. Can we break them out today? Sure thing. Yeah, I've got them right back here and the one right next to me let me know what you want to see and I'll, I'll play something on them a show can farewell great tune unfortunately that is copyrighted that is a jay unger tune and copyrighted so i'm going to pass on that one but you can find lots of versions out there um a, a lovely tune that's definitely one of the first tunes i learned <laughs> i played a couple hours yesterday does that count it sure does yeah if you're playing it's adding to the it's adding to the the pot of hours so you know if you if you if you put the time in you can't get any worse you know if you keep trying you can't get worse that's the way i think about it cool thanks for the kind words dennis glad you're enjoying the lessons 
If it weren't so hot outside, I'd go outside and play. My neighbor seems to enjoy my fumbling. Yeah, it's a hot one. We've got a little heat wave here. It's supposed to almost hit 100 this weekend. Everybody stay cool and hydrated. Weezer is historically, like, usually around, like, 100 degrees, and we really lucked out. It was, like, in the 70s and 80s. It was beautiful. Last year, it was, like, over 110 all week, and I did not go. This was my first Weezer. And I thought about it last year, and then life got busy, and it was, like, 110 degrees. And I'm from Maine, so I'm not used to that kind of heat, but... Nice. Bean Blossom is back going. Didn't get to make it. Hopefully next year. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you got a lot of good stuff going on around here, Lewis. You played a Contra dance. I have played mostly the thing I've done probably maybe a large number of the hours that I have put in as a musician have come from playing Contra dances. You know, uh, you know that, that probably, I don't know how many Contra dances I've played, maybe a between 500, let's say 500 contra dances, and they each last three hours. <laughs> That's 1,500 hours of playing contra dances. Most of that on, like, being a, a guitarist. Like, I play tenor guitar mostly for contra dance. Um, I love playing contra dances. I just played a Kaylee. Oh, maybe that's what you're wondering about. You said you played a contra dance. I just played a Kaylee. It's an Irish community dance. Um, it was the first dance I've played since, since I left in 20, since I left Maine in 2020. Uh, it was super fun. I had not played that many Kayleys. It's, it's a lot of similar, it's very similar. Um, there's a, a couple different things. Like you often play through the A part once just to get everybody to like hear rather than just giving potatoes. One, two, three, and go. Everybody jumps in. You get the A part of the tune once and then you play the A part two times more. So you end up playing the A part three times because um, the dance only starts at the end of the first A. Um, and I was also playing tenor banjo, which was a lot of fun. Um, not Maybe the first dance I've played, well, I don't know. Um, but it's the first, it's it's not every day I get to play a, a dance of any sort just being the tenor banjo player. It was me a piper dash fiddle player and a keyboard player super fun awesome ellen says first time on the live chat enjoying the little tunes uh learn by ear so it works well for me awesome glad to hear people learning by ear that's the way to go in my opinion i see you've been playing with allison de groot yes i got to record with allison um for my our friend owen marshall's record which should probably be out late in this year i don't know there's no particular time but in april um got together with owen and a bunch of friends including allison um to record an album and it was super fun and i actually just saw allison and tatiana they did a show um if you haven't seen their duo or heard their records so allison de groot is an amazing claw hammer banjo player tatiana hargraves is an amazing fiddle player they both have put out a couple albums now. They just put out a second album, both of which are amazing. I know they're doing some touring around. If you get the opportunity, go see that duo because they are amazing. And from Alabama, good to have you here. Can you set? Uh, can you explain turnarounds? That's a good question. I mean, it's a pretty uh, it, turnarounds can mean a number of things, I guess. Um. That's a that's a good question. I don't exactly know how to like define turnaround. That would be a good lesson for like a like I think turnaround. It can mean a couple things. It can mean like kind of especially in like folk music. Um, it can sort of mean what is like often more kind of classically referred to as like a cadence, like a little like chordal movement. Like if you're trying to explain the form of a tune to someone. Um, kind of quarterly you could say oh it's got this little turnaround where it goes a four, five, one. and that's sort of like more of what you might think of as like a cadence in kind of classical music parlance um it can also mean kind of melodically like oh yeah it's got this tricky little kind of turnaround in the middle that goes like it, it can just be a little moment in the tune it's, it's a pretty kind of wide-ranging especially in folk music uh, it can often mean like, and let's do a little turnaround at the end. Like maybe you you play a little like, um, you know, a little outro, or you re repeat 
the last phrase of the tune, just as a little uh, kind of outro to the arrangement of the tune, can mean a number of things. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you could almost kind of uh, just kind of plug it in for the word like f phrase or like musical idea. It, it's, it's, it's a very, I've never really thought about it that hard. It doesn't really, there's so many, at least in the ways that I run into it, um, it it's pretty wide ranging. So it's just sort of, <laughs> it's sort of like doodad or something. It's just, it's a word that like is very kind of con contextual. Um, so you just got to kind of listen to how it's being used in a sentence. And it usually just kind of refers to a, a particular moment in music, but that can mean a number of things depending on how it's used. Ooh, can I play Skyboat song? Ooh, maybe what I'll do is um, play Skyboat song on a big old mandocello. How about that? <laughs> There's a little bit of Skyboat song that also got used as recently in it's like the Outlander theme. I, don't, I never saw the show, and I'm not really that tuned into TV, but I feel like that tune got used as like a theme song for something. But it's a very old melody. Um, yeah, great tune. Oh, let me see. Don't have a King of the Fairies list. I thought I do. Let me just look on the website here real quick. King of the Fairies. Oh, yeah. It's in there. If you if you search on my website for King, um, it's it's in there. I got the, the tune and the by ear and the sheet music and the play along tracks and all the... All the standard fare. <laughs> Let's see. James says, just four weeks until I finally get my hands on the Luthier Commission mandolin. Delayed a few times due to COVID, but very much looking forward to getting my hands on it. Yeah, congratulations. Having just been there a couple months ago, I, I know what you're feeling. The excitement is real. But definitely keep us posted once you, once you get them in your hands. Leed says, hey, Baron, how do you think your 60s Martin tenor compares to the 30s one? And what, what did I miss something about tenor scale length? Okay, we're in a little tenor guitar zone. I don't have all those instruments out, but I'll, I can talk about them. Um, so uh, how do you think your 60s compares to the 30s? And what do you think is the difference between the arch top and the flat tops? Well, um, so the 60s one that I own 
is currently not with me. It's in Maine for the summer. Um, I'm going to go see it in August. <laughs> um, but it's a weird one. It's I've never played an instrument quite like it. It's kind of, I don't know, it's... <laughs> Maybe I can't actually just, like, talk about it. I mean, I think if you, like... Have I done a, a YouTube video on my personal channel? Can't remember. Um, I would say the 30s Martin that I have is very kind of classically what you think of, like, kind of, like, old Martin pretty. It's very um, balanced. It's it's kind of... <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at talking about things here. Let me... So this is neither of those. This is my Collings. Probably not very in tune, so I'm gonna have to tune it. But um, I would say that this Collings sounds more like the 30s. I feel like, you know, most modern builders building to that style. You know, building towards kind of that 30s golden era spec. So there's the flat top kind of Martin style um, compared. To the tenor, I'm oh, sorry, the arch top. Um, so this is much more kind of mid-rangey, doesn't have that really warm, kind of mushy, like all the strings kind of stick out from one another. I, what I love about the old kind of Martin flat top styles is they're kind of, they're very, all the strings kind of blend together. You get a beautiful accompaniment sound. I also tune flat tops GDAD, and this thing I've got GDAE, so it's a little different. This thing is much more kind of punchy and loud and mid-rangey. Sparkly. Um, and I just kind of use them very different. I would say between the 30s and the, sorry, the 30 uh, Martin that I've got and the 60, the 60 kind of sits between arch top and like the really, and like the callings that you just heard. Um, it's a little more punchy. It's kind of, it's got a little bit more kind of string separation where it's not quite as kind of uh, congealed. I don't, know, I don't know how to talk about tone, man. It's hard. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of that's my thoughts. Um, I think of the archtop as a much more melodic instrument. And the one last question here um, about uh, t tenor guitar scale length. Do you have any different scale length tenor guitars, or do you settle on one in particular? I have a relatively long scale instrument, but played short scale tenor banjo, and it was a dream. So in general, on tenor guitars, I like 23 inches, which is what this is. It's what my, all my kind of Martin style uh, tenor guitars is. It's the classic 
historical uh, scale length for most tenor guitars. They did make shorter ones, um, like the Martin like 515s and the 115s. Um, those are on like a 21 inch scale, which is equivalent to kind of like short scale banjo. Um, in general, I like 23 inch. That said, it, it, kind of for melodic playing, it is more of a stretch. Um, so like the tenor banjo that I play is closer to 19. It's very short and I've just kind of figured out how to make that work and it's a little quicker to get around. Um, and then the, I can't even remember what the scale is this thing. I think this is like 18 and a half. So this is, the low strings on this are GDAE with a high B. So I think it's like an 18 inch scale, which is even shorter. But this is also electric, so you don't need that long scale. Like the strings can be floppier. <laughs> um, in general, I like 23, especially for that low G. Um, because kind of the longer the scale length, the better that G string is gonna sound. All right, let's see here. <laughs> Catch up with the chat a little bit. Yep, you can have the, the taters in, in the South. Yep, potatoes, taters, um, however you wanna think about it. James says, Tati and Allison are such a good duo. Agreed. Allison's work with Bruce Molsky, yeah. Well, yeah, when you were Bruce Molsky's banjo player of choice, that says a lot. That's true. Sherry says, Baron, how many different instruments do you take with you when you go to festivals? There's an upcoming music festival where I live, and I will be taking my mandolin and guitar. So it kind of depends on, on the festival. So if I'm going to, like that, the old time one I went to, I brought a six-string guitar, the Archtop Smart and a mandolin, the Ellis Oval Hole. I thought about bringing a banjo, but didn't. We really kind of had the car full by the time. By, by the time everything was in the car, I didn't really have space for a banjo. And it's just one more thing to keep track of. Uh, when I went to, when I go to like Irish camps, I usually bring like a bazooki and a tenor banjo. Um, maybe a mandolin if I've got space. Um, if I'm going like, when I would go teach at camps, like main fiddle camp, and I lived half an hour away, then I would just load up the car with as many instruments as I could, kind of one of everything. Especially, you know, in May, it's going like main fiddle camp, there's so many different kinds of music. Uh, you know, there's old time music, there's Irish music, there's New England music, there's Scandinavian music. So I kind of want to be a little prepared there. So I'll often bring to main fiddle camp, I'll bring a tenor guitar, Mandolin, six string guitar, bazooki, tenor banjo, maybe an accordion if I if I want to spend a little time on that and there's an accordion teacher there. Um, lots of options. Ah, nice. Yes, it is Outlander. Cool. Nice. Cool. Yeah, that's a good. I always like it when when old tunes kind of enter the public again and. He was like, that kind of happened with the Outlander theme. Yeah, definitely more mellow on the, the Martin. This thing is punchy and loud and uh, very, very different. What kind of plans do you have for that arch top? More jazz? Um, yeah, I do want to play, especially, so another interesting thing that I wasn't expecting about going to Weezer was there's a bunch of amazing swing musicians there, um, you know, playing kind of swing and jazz and all that cool stuff. And I do kind of want to get back into that stuff. I haven't played that kind of music in a really long time. Um, but I also just like it more, like, I, I also like this, you can do some kind of like uh, Texas competition style fiddle backing. Um, you know, you take like kind of fiddle tunes, but you do a little bit of that kind of swing, many chord backing. The ho. Yeah, 
kind of end up doing a lot of that. It works really well for like contra dances as well. It's kind of all, it's very rhythmically chunky, which helps the dancers, but it also has a nice chord movement to kind of spice things up and keep thing in things interesting. At some point, my next project is to get some custom pickups made for this, the, the tenor and the six string. Um, I'm not going to do it for the mandocello, um, but get some like floating pickups made um, so I can plug these things in a little bit to help out with that kind of jazzy electrified sound. Um, but also I really just like it as like a solo instrument um, for kind of slower melodies. kind of rings rings out in a nice way that I really enjoy it's a, a different sound um, Todd says any tips for increasing speed on the mandolin shifting from wrist to elbow I'm gonna put the mandolin back out here so uh, I've got some lessons more in depth on my website um, if you look up like Speed, it's all in the technique and fundamental section. Either you can look up like search speed or faster or fast, you know, things like that. Or just browse through the technique and fundamental section. Um, in general, you are totally right with kind of shifting from wrist to elbow. If you're, what I think of for me, like the optimal right arm experience is a little bit of everything. Um, you know, so you want your wrist to be in the, in the equation a little bit. You want your elbow to be in the equation. That really allows your kind of, especially for tone production as well, as you get faster, you know, the whole weight of your arm is getting transferred from the kind of into the pick, into the string, versus just your wrist kind of making that action happen. Um, you know, I think the, the more relaxed you can be with your right hand technique is really going to help with speed. Um, and so that's a lot of kind of the right hand stuff and pick direction too is like maybe number one like if your pick direction is out of sorts your right hand is like not really gonna know should i be going up or down and that's really gonna slow you down and make things sloppy um and then there's always kind of the left right hand coordination of you know like is your is your if you play a scale is it gonna come out like this nice and smooth or is it gonna if your hands are mismatched it might sound like this you know so the either the 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 pick is hitting the string before your left hand hits the fret it needs to or after that's gonna kind of muddy up the sound um, and then keeping your left hand nice and relaxed you know the faster we go often the harder we are naturally trying to play and the more we squeeze with our fingers but ultimately, speed has nothing to do with how hard we're interacting with the instrument. Keeping all of that in mind, you know, practicing slow, getting your technique nice and in order, and also spending a little bit of time just like trying to play fast, even if it's sloppy, just to, to teach yourself what it feels like to actually move your hands that fast. Um, I think those are, uh, that's the majority of kind of how I approach getting faster. Working with a metronome, again, lots more in-depth stuff on all of that on the website. Wow, all right, I think I caught up with the chat. Y'all are falling down on the job. <laughs> um, but I'll play a little tune here, and then we, I'll wait for a couple more questions, and then pretty soon here we'll jump into 
whatever that tune is of the week, uh, Phoebe Ice. Let's see. speed because that got kind of sloppy but there's a tune it's not on my website it's called katie did nice c tune all right let's see uh neil says been working on sh pig's foot but nowhere close to the speed you play at in the intro yeah i mean that's i think like one thing with speed is it's, it's such a strange balance like i learned to play fast just by kind of being in the hot seat mostly like especially for when i was playing a lot of contra dances like at, at first and still like my like you know my natural pacing for a tune is probably 80 to 90 percent of what like kind of contra dance speed speed is which is usually like 120 beats per minute um and you know so to kind of get pushed into that spot where you need to be playing for a, at, at a certain speed to really kind of make it work for the dancers um, that was sort of like, whoa, okay, this is going to be a lot of work. Um, so it's, it's, it's a balance, I think, of, you know, just like try to keep up. Like put on that recording um, or any recording and also you know, like using, well, too many ideas in my brain at once. Uh, put on that recording and just see if you can keep up, you know, just like it's not going to be clean. It's not going to be the best playing you've ever done. But you do need some amount of practice just like at that speed. Uh, even if it's sloppy, you know, nobody's listening. You're playing along with the recording. I promise I can't hear you, even though I made the recording. <laughs> and just sort of like, you know, moving your hands. Even if you're just going like, okay, what is Pig's Foot? You know, even if you're playing it like super sloppy. You know, just like the act of moving your right hand that fast, moving your left hand that fast, even if you just take it one hand at a time. Just kind of working at that speed, even if it's sloppy, is going to teach your hands like, okay, this is what it feels like to be at this speed. And then you can start to think like, where am I falling down? Is it my right hand getting tired or off beat? Is my left hand not able to keep up? All that sort of stuff and then you can work with like a slow down program so take that tune slow it down to 75 percent see if you can keep up there find that spot you can keep up and then start ramping it up by five percent at a time and as you kind of get more comfortable with the tune again pick direction is always always the challenge so make sure you get your pick direction in order or it's just never going to feel natural um, and just kind of build up slowly from there Oh, interesting. So Joe Walsh, uh, 
teaches to strike strings from the wrist and move between the string courses from the elbow. I like that. It's kind of like a, it kind of reminds me of like kind of violin technique where you, you're kind of doing this and then to change strings, your elbow goes up and down a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, everybody does it a little different. So that's sort of like, that feels very unnatural to me, but I mean, Certainly, if it works for Joe, he's a killer player with some of the best tone in the game. So, um, yeah, that's great. Sharon Gilchrist give the same elbow wrist advice. Cool. I've not heard that, but, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, that's all, all good information on that kind of elbow wrist idea. How do you insure your instruments? Good question. I use a company called Heritage, I think. Um, you know, a lot of they're they're great. I've had I've never had, thankfully, knock on wood, I've never had to, you know, um, whatever it's called, you know, like get get a payout from them from a lost or broken or stolen instrument or anything. Um, but uh, they, I've, from everything I've heard. They're great. They're really easy to work with. I change my number of instruments all the time. <laughs> and uh, they're always great. And the only thing, as far as I can remember, again, don't take this as how it works, but my understanding is the only thing they don't insure against is instruments being stolen from inside of an unlocked car. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, like a lot of times people are like, oh, yeah, I've got like homeowner's insurance. And... It really depends on, you know, a lot of things like instruments are not going to be in kind of covered under homeowner insurance. I don't, I am not an insurance person. I don't know how it all works. Um, but I just know that a lot of homeowner insurance is sort of like, oh yeah, we don't actually cover such and such. So for me, I just have everything through Heritage. They've always been great. We're very easy to work with. Um, and I've heard great things from people who have had to file claims. Cool. Well, it looks like we are getting towards the end of the hour, so let's all get our mandolins tuned up and play a little bit of Phoebe Ice. Um, had a couple of weeks to work on it, so I hope you're ready. If not, just try to follow along, you know? Again, nobody nobody can hear you. I can't hear you, so just see what you can get out of this tune. Um, it's in the key of G. It's pretty straight ahead. See if you can pick up little phrases as we go along. Um, the way it works, I'll play the melody, you play the chords, then we'll swap. So you play the melody, and I'll play the chords and back you up. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun time. It's, it's a pretty straight ahead tune. You know, even you can just kind of get the shape. I was doing this for the past week of just like hearing tunes I've never heard before and being like, all right, like the nice thing with old time tunes is they play them like with Irish tunes. Often you get them three or four times, maybe even two sometimes. Um, and then it's on to the next tune where with old time tunes, you'll play it a dozen times through maybe, maybe more. And, uh, you know, you have a little time to really figure it out. So. It's a great way to practice and think like, okay, I don't know this tune, got to figure it out on the fly. What can I figure out here? Um, and just kind of do your best. So yeah, if you don't know this tune, see what you can figure out on the fly. If you do know this tune, let's do it. Let's kind of just try to challenge yourself wherever you're at. Maybe you're trying to play it up to speed. Maybe you've got it up to speed. Now it's time to add some double stops or other ornamentation. Maybe you don't know the tune at all and you're just going to try to figure out what the chord progression is or what the... Uh, kind of the overall shape of the melody is even if you don't have every single note and we'll, we'll have a good time with it here so uh bb ice it's also on my website if you really like the sound of the tune you can always learn it on the website hey around there one i'll play the melody you play the chord one starts on the g here we go one two three
nice long little lope through that tune good stuff all right well getting towards the end of the hour last chance for any questions also definitely put in the chat if you have a request for next week's live stream i think i'll be here next week um yep looks 
like it. Um, so yeah, what are we going to play next week? Let me know in the chat. Thank you all so much for the support and however it comes through. Greatly appreciated. All the links are in the description. Patrons, I will see you all tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern for the patron-only live stream. So anyone who supports me at $5 a month or more gets one of these ideas. Uh, live stream once a month, but patrons only get to dive into topics a little more in-depth. Um, all sorts of good stuff like that. Um, and yeah it's a good time the butterfly or the earl's chair all right let me look up i don't know if we've done the earl's chair have i taught the earl's chair i'm gonna look at my handy dandy notes from denise here thank you as always denise um i love that you know i'll never get bored of that one i think we are on for next saturday yes So what was it? Butterfly or Earl's Chair? Let's see. The Butterfly. We did episode... Oh, we did The Butterfly last time. <laughs> uh, episode 130. So let's not do that. Earl's Chair. We have not done The Earl's Chair. Hey, thank you so much, Joe, for the, the string fun super chat. Really appreciate it. Um... Earl's chair, how did that go? playing old time in a row takes away from the irish brain but uh, I'll, I'll practice up you do the same thing we'll play earl's chair next week great suggestion we have not done that one at all and it is on my website if you want to learn it so thank you all so much for tuning in have a great rest of your week patrons i will see you tomorrow and keep on picking don't put the mandolin down just because i'm done uh yeah check out the discord and have a good time Bye bye